Welcome to the North Point Space. I'm the Mac and Server Crime Fighter. Joining me this week as part of the uh, 10 most, most influential people in Central Illinois Wrestling, original recipe Matt Cage, one half of multiple different tag teams, but mainly one quarter of the C4. How are you doing tonight? I am pleasant at best. Our sponsor on this edition of Nosebleed Seats, November 8, 2011. Well, if I knew we were going to be doing sponsors, I would have brought an IWAP PDD up here. But this was a good show. I was on it. So you can buy that. On the Midwest? Oh, no. Different show. Out. Different show. Oh, well, let's make things appear. Hmm. Website, email, Twitter, Life Journal, Twitter. Facebook, MySpace, cross that out, no one uses it anymore. So you've been watching all you need episodes. And your stuff are? Facebook, Form Spring, Words with Friends, Xbox Live, PSN, those are all not mine, I don't have Xbox Live and PSN. Moving on. <laughs> and you have Facebook, you got Twitter. I do. But I follow me on Twitter, at Proud Caucasian. And on YouTube you have IWA, unauthorized IWA1. Yes, or my own personal account at The Cage Effect. Looking back on the first three years of your wrestling career, um, started down in Atlanta, Georgia. Came up to Central Illinois. Did. I was practically the first one to discover you in a small town in Springfield, Illinois. Right after you wrestled at a uh, GAW show. GAW! Back in 2008. It was forever ago. And then after that, you're all over the place. Uh, I am like gonorrhea. I spread with the quickness. <laughs> Let's go back all the way to uh, the wrestling school, WWA4. Uh, I know we uh, did an hour and a half interview. Yeah, the first time. It was so long. Yeah, I'm just learning how to be a TV interviewer with a newly acquired time slot on XS4, and now we got a time slot on EPTV6 with Champagne Urbana. Uh. I guess a brief reflection on uh, your uh, tenure at the uh, wrestling school. Uh, WWA 4 was a quality wrestling school. I will stress it and I will say it until I am blue in the face. If you get trained, if you want to be a professional wrestler, go to a quality training school. Do not settle for Joe Schmo, Joe Blow, you know, random guy, because chances are you're not learning from someone who has learned from someone good. Uh, or Maybe not someone good, but someone that is worthy enough to be a trainer. Now, there are some local guys that are worth training and, and that know their, their basics. That's the main thing. There's some people that don't. But I feel it's my big bias because I train there, but WWA4 is the best school in the country. Not only do I say that because I train there, but look at some of the people that they've turned out. I mean, they, right now on, on the wrestling scene, I never mind myself. Yeah, Jonathan Gresham, who has wrestled in Japan, Europe. He spent six, six to eight out of the last 12 months in Europe. Uh, Uha Nation just broke out big time overnight sensation, not my theme song. Uh, broke out just like that. Uh, Navy Blue signed with WWE last year. He's no longer with WWE, but he was there. Wow. Uh, developmental? Yes, he was developmental. Uh, he was released, but got signed. That's all that matters. Um, see, I mean, for that matter, Heath Slater. Say what you will about him, but he has made it to the dance. So, uh, WWE 4, Mr. Hughes, uh, Elon Skipper, who is not training there anymore. He is 
pretty much retired from the wrestling business. But if it's Hughes still training, you can find more information at WWA4.com. Thank you. And as for my time there, I'm sorry. My time at the training school was quality. Uh, I learned uh, a smorgasbord of valuable knowledge. Um, and pretty much all of that knowledge that I learned back then, uh, I still use today. And uh, I feel that Hughes' training and input was a great necessity, obviously. And have your trainer's stamp of approval is something that means a lot to you. And I got the stamp of approval. It might not have come overnight, no. but it did happen eventually. So that's all that matters. Now, uh, you're originally from Las Vegas, Nevada, yes. and I think sooner or later, Don Kim or Ralph's probably contacted you for a book when he opens New Free Out in Vegas. But, he uh, does do that. I, I will go work with him because uh, far be it for me to turn down a booking in a state, city, area, territory, anything that is more warm than the Midwest, because it is, I don't know, uh, right now, in, the 30s, in all the Illinois, snow it is the 31 ground. degrees, and I would much rather be in Vegas right now, uh, where it's 70 degrees. I know that there's a promotion in Vegas called Future Stars of Wrestling. I went there. Uh, I did not wrestle with them, but I was going to wrestle with them, and they have a pretty good deal, so if... Uh, Mr. Morales starts a promotion in Vegas. He's gonna have a tough task on his hands because they uh, have got that sitting on the lock. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, did you ever wrestle in Vegas? Uh, from your hometown fans? I never did wrestle in Vegas, unfortunately. Uh, when I moved from Vegas to begin training uh, in most days when you seven, uh, I there was no wrestling uh, promotion, school, anything. There was one when I was growing up. They closed down with Scott Casey, who trained Booker T, and uh, Nick Bockwinkle, and uh, Harley Race would go out there and do seminars and what have you. They closed down. There was a guy named Buffalo Jim, who was a scam artist, who has subsequently been murdered. Uh, and literally, years, yes, he is murdered. Oh, wow. He is dead. They found him in a hotel. Dead. Oh, oh my. So that was that was happening. And uh, so I moved to Atlanta, WWE 4. And then subsequently I find out that there is now a training school in Vegas. I was extremely upset, but at the same time not because I would not have changed my experiences. Uh, long story short, um, that was around the time when the Benoit thing happened, and they were trying to regulate wrestling in Georgia, and not that I feel that it's a bad idea or a good idea, but some of the rules that they came up with were really stupid and oh, ludicrous. Yeah. Uh, basically, one of them, just to give you a hint, was you cannot wear long pants in the ring, long tights. You cannot wear baby oil. Uh, oh boy, this was the best. This, 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 first time here. this was the best one. Uh, you're choking your opponent on the ropes in wrestling. Currently, it is a five count. Otherwise, you get disqualified. They wanted to change it to a ten count. Now, as my trainer, we, uh, went to, we went to court. We all went to court, a bunch of wrestlers. My trainer, Mr. Hughes, was like, let me tell you something, Judge. Uh, you're choking a man for five seconds, you get disqualified. I can choke a man for ten seconds and kill him. So, uh, anyway, so basically between that, uh, myself and a few other wrestlers have fallen out with the owner, not the trainer, not Mr. Hughes, but the owner of the WWA 4 school. Uh, and then a few other wrestlers were looking to move. The Hooligans being two of them, they were originally from Illinois. Uh, so they were like, we're from Illinois, we're moving up there. Uh, we had, I was aware of various places up here, either in mid south was a goal of mine. Uh, and uh, myself and a few other wrestlers moved to Springfield. Uh, wrestlers, they no longer wrestle. Uh -huh. But anyway, the Hooligans moved back uh, here to Springfield where they live. East St. Louis, and uh, they build themselves from. Yes. Not East St. Louis, but right, right from then, pretty much. And the uh, rest, as they say, is history. So that is how I chose to move up here. Basically, the way I see it is this. Uh, when I moved to Springfield, uh, or for that matter, when I moved to the state, all I wanted to do was get booked. Um, I didn't care where, I didn't care about who, all I wanted to do was get booked. I moved, in Spring I moved to Springfield. Who runs in Springfield? Justin McIntyre runs in Springfield. First place I found out about. I did not get booked for Newman West Wrestling until 2010. Uh, I moved to Springfield in 2000, was at the end of 2007. So, yeah. um, and uh, I contacted all the local promotions. I contacted uh, 
uh, NGW. Uh, I contacted New Midwest. I actually went to a New Midwest show. You were there. You were so pissed when Oliver Kane and, and Jason Light broke those nosebleed seats awards over their knees. You were so angry. And I didn't understand why, but I was there in the crowd watching, and uh, it was unexpected. Let's put it that way. Oh, you were so angry. Um, and then the, oh, the first person that said, yes, we will use you, actually was not GAW, it was a place in Chicago called UWC, not UWC Paris. Uh, no. And I was like, okay, we went up there, promotion was meh, but it was work. I went up there, worked with my roommate, had fun. Next week, they beat for GAW, so I saw Jackson Pride. I didn't care about wrestling for championships or anything of the sort. All I wanted to do was wrestle. So I out there and did. People who were GAW regulars were upset, Dumpster Duck, and they're like, oh, we're he's, talking about he's a new guy, he doesn't deserve a title shot, it's like, oh, get over yourself, man, you know what I mean? It's it's wrestling. It is it is not about one person, it is about the show and the fans. Now, uh, the wrestlers want to get experience, I was new to the area, all I wanted to do was wrestle, that's all I wanted to do, that's what I did. So, he's talking about... For the viewers at home, Danger Doug Price, who is now retired. Dumpster. Let me really quick tangent. To okay. retire from something, I feel that you have had, you have to have made a living off of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel that anyone who has not made a living off of it has retired more so that they have hung them up or quit. Well, he has not shot. wrestled for a couple of years, so he's not wrestling. He has not tried to wrestle again, as far as I know. And I believe that he shifted the video work. Oh. Good for good for dumpster duck. Let me state for the record that evolution is a mystery. Evolution. It's Motorhead. Okay. See what I did there. All right. Anywho, uh, from 2008 until now. Let's see. When I moved to Illinois, when I started wrestling, for that matter, I was just a black guy in tights. Uh, thank. You. Thank the maker that there are no pictures or videos that exist of me before you saw me because I had the most god-awful pair of powder blue airbrushed tights that I bought off of former NWA uh, perennial uh, jobber to the stars, I guess, Rocky King. Yeah. And, oh man, they were wretched. And then I got a pair of custom gear. But uh, I was just a black guy in tights. I didn't have a character. I was just out there trying to wrestle and gain experience. Uh, I feel that I did so, um, and I started to make a name for myself. And it wasn't until the beginning of two, so it was the end of 2008, when a friend of mine, Marcus Crane, uh, and I were having a discussion after a match that I had at MECW in Wood River, and I came to bring a white baseball hat. And I, uh, I was told that I looked like a crazy golfer. So uh, a few weeks later, uh, at a promotion that no longer runs, uh, Scott County Wrestling or Pro Wrestling Next, um, they were like, oh, we're looking for people with bodies or characters. Now at the time, I didn't have a body. Uh, or I, it wasn't a good one anyway. And uh, so I decided to do a golfer gimmick, as it was known. Um, it wasn't really a golfer gimmick. I had a golf club, but I try to make it more of a I am rich, preppy, high class character. And uh, I remember cutting an interview at GAW after I won the prestigious, prestigious crime fighter, GAW Central States Championship that uh, now that I have the gold, that I have begun to get paid more and that I wanted to invest it in the finer things in life such as country clubs. And that, that interview never made air never made YouTube, so that promo completely did not matter in the grand scheme of things, and as such, everyone just thought that I was a golfer. Whatever. It set me apart from a lot of people who just wanted to be known as wrestlers, and that's fine, but I wanted, I wanted to stand out, and at the time, you can go back and think about it, you had a character. Not many people. Now, so. now that was influenced by what Chavo Guerrero did for a little while. It was not, it was not at all. And I remember so many shows that I was on that you were in the crowd and you were so intent on getting that Curlin White chant. So much, in fact, that years later I yelled at you from the ring that your chant was not getting over. You chanted Curlin White so many times at me and never got over. 
Uh, the color and white thing actually had nothing to do with my character at all. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I did it, because it was just a spur of the moment conversation, you look like a crazy golfer. Uh, it's like, I'll just be preppy and, you know, polo shirts is what I think of when I think of preppy. And more so, if anything, who I was trying to rip off with my appearance was not Kerwin White, but in fact, the Mean Street Posse. Really? Yes. Uh, Pete Gas. Pete Gas, Rodney Abs, and, uh, I'm sorry, Pete Gas, Joey Abs, and Rodney. They had those polo shirts and the sweater vests and the khaki pants, and I was a huge mark for them when I was a kid. They were wretched in the ring. You understand me? Yeah, truly, they lost the jobbers. Truly abysmal they were, but I was like, I'm going to rip off their appearance. Not their wrestling skill, but their appearance, and that was what I tried to do. Granted, I, I had the golf club and what have you, and I, my thing was I wanted, I was a heel, I wanted uh, a weapon to use, and I used the golf club several times, broke it over many backs. Uh, once, I actually broke it in half at the IWA Mid-South Tryout show. I hit some guy over the back so hard, and he told me to, to hit him really hard, and I did, because he wanted to show that he could take weapons. And I hit him, and it launched. And it went over with the, uh, the sure crowd did. that voted. Actually, well, I will, yeah, I will go ahead and voting. And I will go ahead and say this: that match was what it was, what have you. But the only reason that we all in that match, everyone pulled up there into the bargain. But to me, the only reason why the credit should actually all go to Bucky Collins and the Dixieland Destroyer, because Dixie was the big guy. And all the other big guys on that show were trying to chain wrestle. Well, to hell with that. If you're 500 pounds, do not chain wrestle. Go out there and slaughter people. And that's what he did. And he killed Bucky. He made Bucky pay for his sins. And then Bucky did a 450 splash off of the apron. It was more of a 450 knee drop. But he did that. And everyone was like, oh man, these guys, they're picking it up. And then we did Finisher Frenzy. And, but the main reason was them. I've told this to Bucky before. That's my opinion, though. Who am I to doubt El Dandy or Bucky Collins? Uh, let's see. Atlanta 8. Myself, Devin Mason Cutter, uh, Chris Steele, Ace Valour, Nick Meir, Felix Skipper, and Joel the Bouncer. Alright. Joel the Bouncer, uh, in summer of 2008, decided that he was done with wrestling and moved back to Florida with his uh, wife and daughter. I have not heard from him since. Uh, he was my bouncer. He was my bouncer. Did you know that? Only like two or three times. Anyway, he moved back to Florida. I have not heard from him since. Uh, he stole things from myself and my other roommate, Nick Meir, who uh, several weeks after Joel decided to, to leave, decided he wanted to quit wrestling also and pursue mixed martial arts, which uh, I have not talked to him since 2008. Uh, there was a semi falling out, real childish and petty, but I was really upset. Uh, about him quitting wrestling, especially because uh, we um, we got a lease on an apartment in Springfield. And I remember the day we moved there, I said, you want to get a three month lease, six month lease, nine month or 12 month? I think we should get six. He said, oh, we'll get 12, it'll be no big deal. I was like, are you sure? We can get six and renew it. Oh, nothing happened, we'll get 12. He quit wrestling in six months. So we had a year lease and I was like, uh, oh, things happen. Anyway, he quit wrestling. A week before he quit wrestling, Felix Skipper decided that he wanted to move to Michigan, back to Michigan, where he is originally from. Uh, now, I have not talked to him recently, I've talked to him within the last year. Uh, he was wrestling, not frequently. Uh, I always felt that he had a lot of potential, and had he wrestled a uh, regular uh, schedule, um, that he would have been pretty good. If he would have gotten in like, shape, like he, he had talent, I thought, he could bump. Oh man, he could bump like a madman. But I don't know if he, I love guy to death. Uh, if he was here, I'd, you know, still be friends with myself and super friend. I just hadn't talked to him for a while, but. I uh, wasn't in. His heart wasn't as into it as other people. So okay. he's gone. Uh, Chris Deal never actually wrestled in Central Illinois. Uh, I believe we've discussed this before. He moved, not with us, but he moved to St. Louis, where he is from. Uh, after we all moved at the same time period, he wrestled once at the UWC that I mentioned uh, in Chicago in a match. It was him and Ace Moore versus Hooligans. There's no footage of it. It does not exist. Therefore, it never happened as far as I'm concerned. And then that was that. Uh, in the summer of 2009, he was at an IWA Mid-South show looking to get booked. 
uh, that night I wrestled Sal Tomaselli, and he, in a coffee fashion, came up to me and was like, oh man, you did okay. And I was like, all right, well, you're not booked, you know? But anyway, I have not seen or heard from him in quite some time. Uh, he had a lot of, like, he started before me, and he could have gone and done things. He was really athletic for 6'4", 240 pounds of stacked African-American muscle. Uh, and then Ace Moore wrestled a handful of times at GAW, never really made an impact. He moved home to Wisconsin. He was from Wisconsin, I believe. And uh, last we heard, uh, there were several videos of him wrestling in a backyard on a trampoline. Uh, so that was about a year or two ago. So I think it's safe to say that he no longer is a professional wrestler. And that brings us down to myself and the hooligans uh, who are what? still active. With the later year additions of Jonathan Grisham on occasion. I don't really count him as an Atlanta 8 because he never moved from here. He yeah. just wrestled from here. Okay. And he wrestles a Raw also. Ah, uh, okay. The Atlanta 8 was your creation. I know, because there's eight, eight people that came up for life to draw noise, and I had to come up with something. Originally, it was um, the Georgia 7, but then the eighth person showed up, so I just changed it. How did you uh, end up making IWAU your home promotion? Oh, man. Uh, I don't remember when the last time we had an interview. I think we did a podcast, but I can't remember if I actually explained it, but I'll explain it again. Uh, at the tail end of 2009, I began to hate wrestling. There were a uh, number of things that caused me to fall out of love with wrestling. Uh, I began to put on more weight. I just really stopped caring and was looking for an out. Never, like, I could have just quit at any time. But instead, I continued to wrestle uh, and continued to not enjoy it. In December of, 2000, uh, excuse me, excuse me, December of 2009, I uh, was reading results from your website and uh, reading the results for here at IWA Unlimited. Who is this Danny Cannon guy wrestling Christian Rhodes and such? Uh, I saw the name. I, anytime I saw someone's name, you know, I'd like to see who they are. Uh, and uh, I knew Christian Rhodes. We were a part of the League of Champions in GAW and we never held championships at the same time. Uh, <laughs> Anywho, uh, I always thought Christian Rose was a nice guy. We were friends behind the scenes. At the time, I didn't think he was very good. Uh, he did not think he was very good. Um, anyway, I want to see these matches. So I went and YouTube. I found a match that they had at the IWAU Arena at the Christmas event in 2009, and it was awesome. And I was like, wow, why doesn't Christian Rose have these matches at GAW? Before I realized that he was wrestling with, you know, Tom so Riley. Uh, <laughs> but. Um, Jackson Pride, JC Bunnies, <laughs> you know, Jonathan Nate, yeah, you, you know, Josh Powers. I like Jonathan Nate. He, 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 I like Josh Powers too, actually. I have nothing to say against that bad. But uh, anyway, I mean, the, the legendary matches between Project Mayhem and Abuse of Power, though, were stuff of a legend, okay? They were some real barn burners. I'm saying that because my tag partner, Alex Castle, is walking that way, and he's quite fond of those matches. But anyway, <laughs> um, I was like, oh, Christian Rose has gotten a lot better, even though I had just recently seen him wrestle. But uh, it was Dan Hannon. He's you know, really good. He had really green. But I was like, he's flippy, and I want to wrestle him. Uh, and at the time, I didn't really work as a baby face very often, uh, if at all. And I was looking for quality baby faces to work with. So I was trying to figure out a way to work him. And he didn't really work anywhere else because no one knew who he was. So I was like, well, I will go there then. And it took several months for me to, uh, not to make it here, but to actually come on the show. This was on a Wednesday night. It's on a Wednesday, it's free, and at the time I was really hesitant to do free shows. Uh, and then, because I hated wrestling so bad, I was like, I don't care. And uh, Dave Morrison was running a show in, sometime in 2010 with Eugene, and he was like, oh, and you should, yes. Uh, I, I was told, oh, you should come up and you know get familiar with the fans for IWA Unlimited. Okay, so I went up there, I had a match with Neil Diamond Cutter. Before that, I concocted the plan. I had a booking in Ohio, and it was myself, Neil Diamond Cutter, supposed to wrestle Danny Cannon and Christian Rose. And I was like, yes, I will make it happen. The Danny Cannon canceled on me. I did not get to wrestle him. Fast forward to June of 2010. I am a completely hatred for the wrestling business, and I finally get booked against Danny Cannon at IWAU, back then IWAP. Uh, finally had a match with him. Uh, it was 
very nice and refreshing to work with someone who was just really hungry to have a fun, good match again. Uh, who wasn't looking to make money and they just wanted to have a good match. And that's what we did. And like, he was really excited, I was really excited, we had a really good match. And that was the match that I saved, pulled me out of my rut. And then after that I was like, I need to change things, I need to stop blaming other people for the things that I hate about wrestling, I'm putting all the blame on myself. Uh, and then begun climbing out of my rut. Uh, I began getting in better shape. Uh, now, subsequently, two years later almost, I am in quality shape, I feel. Uh, and uh, shortly after that match with Andy Cannon, uh, I got a text message from Alex Castle saying, if I was to buy a bucket of chicken, would you come to the ring with it? And I said, yes. And he said, if I was to buy a watermelon, would you come to the ring with it? And I said, yes. And he said, if I bought you great Kool-Aid, would you come to the ring with it? And I said, that's racist. And then we, uh, we further continued our conversation, and the Kentucky Buffet was born. And uh, I was at peace with wrestling again, and there you have it. And the, uh, the promotion that at the time I had the most fun working with and working for was IWA Unlimited. Uh, and the thing that pretty much made, I don't want to I hate saying that any place is my home promotion, but because I work here, it's like GAW, people used to go, oh, GAW's are your home promotion. I never really thought of it as such, but that was the place that I worked the most. So IWAU is the place I work the most. As such, I feel I go ahead and say it's my home promotion. The reason why, the thing that cemented it for me was the feud that uh, Kentucky Buffet and the Top Dumps had. It's pretty much, I mean, if you're on the road with a crew, you know, you're a crew. You know, I've, I've had several riding crews since I started wrestling. Uh, they never really had names. Um, but like, for instance, uh, Brett, CJ, Nick, Axis, and Drew Baker, they were the, the Midwest mob, right? right? So that was their, you know, their click, their, their name. I don't know if they came up with that themselves. Or they did. Okay. The C4 thing came about. Uh, we were here, and it was one of those things where I could travel together. We're friends, we're best friends, you know, we train together, we watch wrestling together, we, we have common goals. It's like, if we ever were to become stable, it was, this was all Adam Castle's idea. He calls me one day, and he's so excited. Cage, C4. Yeah, the move, C4. Back to you know, Spanish fly, one man Spanish fly. No, the stable. Cage, Castle, Christian, Cannon. Oh yeah, that's pretty awesome. And then I got t-shirts made for us all for Christmas, and then we were never a stable. <laughs> so, uh, my shirt says Proud Caucasian on it. Anywho, uh, yeah, the C4 thing is more of a backstage thing, but, um, you know, then we have Team Overkill, which is myself, Castle, and Christian. Uh, but because we have actually never had, we only had one trio match yet. Book us as a trio, people! Uh, we have only had Mel Buffet, that was a trio. Um, that, that happened once, I don't really care, but uh, that happened in human West, actually. Um, but we had one trio match at UWC in, inside of War Games. Uh, but you, mostly at this point, if you find Team Overkill, it's actually just me and Christian Rose coming. And we are the current reigning and haven't defended AAPW Tag Team Champions. Which, they're running at the same time tonight as you're having a ladder match. Yes, defending my prestigious, do you understand me, Crimey, prestigious IWA Unlimited Heavyweight Champion. I'm interested to see how they're going to hang the belt up to the ceiling. I don't know either. I, We're going to tie it up to that light fixture up there. But my health is in, in great jeopardy right now. But Which is why we're doing this interview before the show, because you're not going to be really wanting to do any interviews after the show. Nope. If you were trying, if you were to try an interview after this ladder match at Prime Fighter, I would tell you in no particular terms but to F off so I could go apply Tiger Bomb in Icy Hot. Although you did conduct an interview after a four-way ladder match at GAW once. Oh. With Cameron Jacobs of all that people. That match, I choose to uh, believe that it did not happen. It, it was, was a fun, yeah, it's still a fun time. It was a nice demolition derby to an extent. I didn't do anything. I pretty much stood outside of the ring because... But you won. I did win. That is when I won. Champ. That was when I won. Crime Fighter, do you understand me? My prestigious Great American Wrestling Heavyweight Championship. Prestigious! We are all out of time for this edition of the Nosebleed Seats. Next week we're going to continue with part two of our interview. 
with Matt Cage. He's part of the top 10 most influential people in Central Illinois wrestling. See you then.